for the next part, we're looking at a linear process as a statistical model. So what we looked at before was to have yt as an infinite sum of weighted previous epsilons. And that's all fine. In practice, what we'll have is a finite number of observations from yn down back to y1. And the task is then, how do we find an infinite number of parameters given in observations? Well, that's not so fun. There's a lot of things that cannot be done. This is one of the things. So what do we have to do? One way is to say, well, we'll just restrict our sequence of weights up here. How, do, how can we restrict our se sequence? The easiest thing is to say that some of these elements will be zeros. So here we have some typical examples. We have a process where you have the outcome is this weighted sum of the previous q plus 1 residuals or epsilons. That's one kind of model. We call this a moving average model because what we effectively do is that we calculate a weighted average of the most recent epsilons. Now, an alternative model is to say, well, we just have one noisy input, and then we take the current output and say we weight, we put some weight on the previous output, and we just add some noise to that. We call this autoregression because auto means on yourself, so you're doing regression on your previous values, and you add some noise. Last but not least, you can combine these two and have both an autoregressive part and a moving average part. Those are the so-called armor models. And we identify the order of these polynomials with P for the AR and Q for the moving average part. So this is one class, well, the armor model is a superclass with two subclasses of models. And that's one thing that we're going to have a lot of focus on through the rest of this course. In a lot of different settings, but that's where we're going at. Now, thinking back to the operator polynomial from just before, we can write this up here as a theta of B and the backward shift operator, operator applied on epsilon t. This case, it's a finite polynomial. We can use a phi polynomial here to do the autoregressive part, and of course, we can just combine these two polynomials in the backward shift operator to define the armor process. There's one thing that I will say many times is that some software packages will have the AR terms here, only have the YT on the left-hand side, and the remaining parts here will be written on the right-hand side of the equal sign. That means that the sign on the phi's here is positive in this definition, but it will have opposite sign if you have them positive on the other side. That's obvious, but that's just something to be aware of because you will see that at some point in time. So, that's where we are, these processes. In the last bit of the last part, we've talked about stationarity and invertibility. For these particular processes, it's fairly easy because a moving average model is always stationary. You do a weighted sum of a finite number of variables, it's always going to be converging. It's no, never going to, to diverge. The invertibility, well, if you evaluate this polynomial and solve for roots in this, then if all the sets are within the unit circles, then it is invertible. Notice that it's set inverse here, and then they should be inside, whereas in the previous slide, it said that the root should be outside the unit circle. But here's inverse. Inverse is inside, and not inverse is outside. So obviously, it does fit well together. For the autoregressive part, since that is on the other side of the equal sign, 
it's just the reverse. It's always invertible because it's written as a finite sum of the um, previous observations, whereas it's only stationary if the root of phi evaluated set inverse equals zero. If you look at that polynomial, if the roots there are inside the unit circle. Now, finally, the AMA model here, well, you kind of have to look at the stationarity of the roots of the phi polynomial, and you have for in invertibility, you have to look at the roots for the theta polynomial. So basically, you take the complicated part from the MA and the complicated part th from the AR part. And that's where we are. Most often, what we'll care about is stationarity and not so much on invertibility, but that depends on the application. So, as some examples, we're going to look at some processes, and I will give you many more processes to look at later on, um, but not during the lecture here. So, if we have a so-called moving average model of order 2, a particular one of that is this particular one where we have a of course, it has to be a second order polynomial on B. 1 plus 0 0.9 B plus 0 0.8 B squared applied on epsilon T. So, if we look at the autocorrelation of this, we get something where at time 0, well, that's effectively the variance of the correlation with yourself at the current time point in time is, of course, unity. So, per definition, the autocorrelation function is always 1 at lag 0. And then it drops quickly, and after the second lag, where there's no further dependence, then it gets down to be 0. So, maybe this is time where we should look at doing the calculations just to get the experience. So, we have the function, We're looking at the MA2 part up there. What we have to look at, first we have to look at the covariance or the variance, so gamma of time zero. So that's the covariance of yt and yt. So, we just have to look at what we have over here and plug that in. So, it's the covariance of, let me write it as epsilon, epsilon t from the 1 plus 0 0.9 epsilon t minus 1 plus 0 0.8 epsilon t minus 2 comma, and then the other part of it is the exact same thing. It won't fit out there, so epsilon t plus 0 0.9 epsilon t minus 1 plus 0 0.8 epsilon t minus 2. Now, since all these epsilons are IID, well, we only get contributions from those elements that have the same time index. So, what we have here is effectively from epsilon t with epsilon t, we have a sigma square. From 0 0.9 epsilon t minus 1 times 0 0.9 epsilon t minus 1, we again have a sigma square. So, I will start with a 1 here, and then I have a 0 0.9 square from this term here. Likewise, epsilon t minus 2 has a covariance with epsilon t minus 2 of 1. And then we have the coefficient of 0 0.8. And we square them because they are in both parts. So this is gamma 0. Now, if we go for gamma 1, as in for lag 1, then we do the exact same thing with one difference, namely that we shift time for the second part. So, we have the covariance 
of epsilon t plus 0.9 epsilon t minus 1 plus 0.8 epsilon t minus 2, comma, and then we shift time one lag forward to get epsilon t plus 1 plus 0.9 epsilon t plus 0.8 epsilon t minus 1. And here again, we look at terms that have the same time index, and we will have the sigma square outside. And then we have, for epsilon t, we have 0 0.9. And for epsilon t minus 1, we have 0 0.9 times 0 0.8. And epsilon t minus 2, there's nothing down here, and t plus 1, there's nothing up here. So we're done. And when we go for lag 2, all we have to do is to write the process again. The covariance of epsilon t plus 0 0.9 epsilon t minus 1 plus epsilon t minus 2, comma, and then we shift time two steps rather than just one before, and say epsilon t plus 2 plus 0 0.9 epsilon t plus 1 plus 0 0.8 epsilon t. And here, the only term that is, the only epsilon subscript that is joined is 0 0.8 times epsilon t with epsilon t here. So we get 0 0.8 times sigma square. So those were the calculations. And to get to the correlation, you just have to take this divided by that and this divided by that. So that was one example. If you go for the autoregressive model of order 1, say in this example with coefficient minus 0.8, then we have an exponential decay in the autocorrelation function. And what you get is 0 0.8, 0 0.8 square, 0 0.8 cubed, and so forth all the way down. I leave you to do the math. And if you combine these two models into an AMA 1, 2 model, then you first see the contribution from the MA part, and then you have an exponential decay from there. So we have an exponential decay from lag 2. And onwards, it's just exponential. But the first part here, they have kind of some information as well saying that since it's not just an exponential part here, a pure exponential decay, then we have some moving average element somewhere in there. Now, one thing that I won't spend too much time on is the so-called partial autocorrelation function. We have it here. For the moving average part, it gives you an ex damn exponential here. It's hard to see. For the AR1 model, what you get is only a signal in time shift 1. And for the combined model, you see again a combination of the two. Now, so what you want to do is to look at the AR part in the partial autocorrelation function to identify the order. And the correlation function, you want to look at the, sorry, you want to identify the MA part from the autocorrelation function. And the partial autocorrelation function, per definition, is basically st the conditional covariance given all the information from the variables in between. But we can look at that some other time. We also have so-called inverse autocorrelation, which is giving about the same information at the partial autocorrelation function. Basically, what you look at, the dual process where you flip the um, polynomials, and then you look at the autocorrelation function of that inverse function. 